Thank you, Sam. Uh, first, I want to start by saying how honored I am uh, to have been invited to do this and how nervous I am to do this because, as Sam knows and all my graduate students know, technology is not my forte. <clears throat> Fortunately, though, one of my current graduate students and colleague, Sue John Young, is just beside me. So if there's something that is going wrong and I'm starting to have a panic attack, Sue is going to actually really help me this. I want to thank Sam, I want to thank Julian, who is now actually working very, very hard, not only, not only in terms of organizing uh, the series, but also to help the speaker, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, so as Sam mentioned, so we're going to be talking today about uh, practice-oriented research, and I think it's timely that we talk about this because as has been the case for now many decades, most of you know, all of you must know, that there is, there is still quite a bit of disconnect between research, science, and practice. And in large part, this manifests itself by the fact that many practitioners, not all of them, but many practitioners, are not substantially influenced or guided um, by research, by scientific pursuit that is being done uh, by academicians. Um, and Part of this, uh, we need to admit people like myself who are very much involved in science from an uh, academic perspective has to do with the fact that many of our studies do not always attempt to address concerns in the day-to-day -day practice and or that the studies that we are conducting do not necessarily lead to results that are you know, generalizable to the day-to-day -day practice. Um, so one way of attempting to bring closer uh, scientific science researchers and clinicians and to provide uh, research data as, as informations that would be very, very useful to understand the therapeutic process and potentially to improve it is actually to create some or to foster some partnership between researchers and clinicians. One of the things that is absolutely wonderful about such partnership is to have people, really, really smart people and, and uh, full of energy and full of good ideas, but approaching the same phenomenon from different angles. And that tend, and at least in my experience, to lead to a lot of synergy in terms of better understanding and potentially improving psychotherapy. There has been, fortunately, many types of partnership um, that have been created over the years, and that led, in my view, to a lot of uh, really interesting amount of research. Um, my colleague, esteemed colleague, uh, Michael Barkham, uh, Wolfgang Lutz, and Andrew McLeavy have recently uh, offered a summary, a review of uh, this type of research based on partnership in the most recent editions of Mike Lambert's uh, Handbook of Psychotherapy and Behavior Change. And we have actually called this type of research that involve a partnership between clinicians and researcher practice-oriented research. And we actually have made the argument that this is kind of representing some kind of a shift with more traditional research, which we have called evidence-based research. Evidence-based research, in from our perspective, Michael, Wolfgang, Andrew, and I, uh, is coming mostly uh, from the agenda of the researchers, uh, academicians, who, of course, have a lot of things to offer, uh, but they are guided by their research agenda, by their theory, and for many of us, uh, not necessarily influenced by extensive practice. You know, there's only 29 hours in a day, as everybody knows, and so if you're going to do a lot of time teaching and doing research, you're not going to have a lot of time to see a lot of clients. And therefore, your research will be influenced in part by a kind of myopic, more restricted amount of time that is given to clinical practice. This is not to say, obviously, that this research is not helpful, but it's to say that by definitions, it's actually more restrictive in terms of the contact. And the problem with, with clinical reality, and the problem, I think, is when um, the agenda of research is being 
uh, if not guided, if uh, dictated, dictated by academicians, we're running a risk of, of having what I call empirical imperialism. Empirical imperialism is when you have people like me who see one or two clients a week and who has the audacity of saying to the field, well, this is what we should be studying and this is how we should be studying, especially when I'm saying that to clinicians who see 20, 25 clients a week. So the way that Michael, Wolfgang, uh, Andrew, and I presented it is that um, evidence-based practice should remain. Uh, it should be there. There should be academicians that spend most of their time to do research, but there should also be as a complementary perspective, another type of research where there's complementary but also some convergence. And again, as I mentioned, we call it practice-oriented. Practice-oriented is really a type of research where there is a partnership between researchers and clinicians. Of course, the extent, the expense of how much, how much there is a collaboration will actually vary. But definitely, there is a role there of the clinicians to bring their expertise, their point of view, and their ideas. Um, what we, in, in, in the chapter that we have uh, put together, we uh, were able to identify three major types of practice-oriented research. Many of you actually will know uh, at least uh, one of this type of research, which is the patient-focused research. Uh, people who have been SPR for a long time will know that this research is actually directly related to one of the founders of SPR, which is uh, Ken Howard. Uh, this research actually is looking at patterns uh, of patient change. It's also a type of research where there is tracking individual patients' progress uh, over the course of treatment and allowing people to be anticipating what should be the, the actual change of the clients. And as everybody or many people know about the research of Michael Lambert is that this, this, this paradigm, this uh, patient-focused research also includes uh, feedback that are provided to uh, clinicians about the stage of change of where the client is and therefore to be able to identify potentially people who might deteriorate or not actually benefiting from treatment. And then with the help of feedback can really help the clinicians to be more attuned to the client's uh, needs. And Michael Lambert and many of his colleagues have been able to show that actually providing this type of feedback is actually allowing the clinicians to be able to react in a way that decreased significantly um, uh, the, the rate of deterioration, which, which of course, you know, this is our first duty, first not to do harm. So this type of research is really addressing a very important point. A second type of uh, research where uh, Michael Barkham has made a major contribution as well as people like Bruce Wampel and Wolfgang Lutz. It's kind of looking at practice-based evidence now. Um, this is more uh, a, a broader perspective. It does encompass some study that I've looked at patterns of change, but really this type of research has been focusing on what the clinician is doing in or is actual practice. It's include the patient change, but it's also larger. It's, uh, for instance, include the, the major important studies that have been done in terms of the therapist effect where uh, we now have some evidence that there are some therapists that actually, especially when clients uh, are, have very severe impairment, that some therapist uh, seems to be more effective than others, and unfortunately some therapists seems to have more difficulty of, uh, of fostering change in the client. Uh, there is also within this practice-based evidence now studies that have been conducted that compare different setting or different center. Studies that have been able to show, for example, that uh, in some setting, the effect size that uh, we have for psychodynamic treatment, for example, in naturalistic setting, in actual routine, 
are very similar to the FXIs in cognitive behavior therapy, also practice in naturalistic setting. Practice-based evidence that also look at the effect of multiple services or multiple centers. They are wonderful studies that have been conducted, for example, in the UK with Bill Stiles and also Michael Barkham was involved there. That basically show that the effectiveness of different form of therapy is equivalent. So what we have been finding in many of the randomized clinical trial in a control setting, what we call the evidence-based practice, actually also generalize in the day-to-day -day, uh, routine. And the third type of uh, practice-oriented research on this slide there is what we call practice research network. Um, in our view, we define this as potentially the best antidote against empirical imperialism because this is a place where uh, researchers and clinicians can actually develop an active collaborations where the clinicians are involved in all aspects of research, whether it is the generations of idea of what to study, how to study, so the design of the study, but also the statistical analyses as well as the disseminations of the research. So we have here a potential uh, setting where uh, different um, people coming from different source of knowledge, a way of actually examining and understanding psychotherapy can actually really collaborate together to come with some research that address the concerns of the clinicians but also are highly scientifically rigorous. Um, now these three types of research, the way that I describe them, of course, it's arbitrary in terms of distinctions. Uh, uh, and in part because they share a number of characteristics that we highlight in our chapter. So there's a number of convergence, and one of which is that the, the studies are conducted in naturalistic setting. So instead of having studies that very frequently in, in randomized clinical trials are being conducted in a clinical, in, in a control environment, uh, of the academic setting uh, with uh, a lot of inclusion and exclusion criteria, which could be a very good idea, of course, for issues of internal validity, but may have restriction in terms of external validity. These studies, these practice-oriented research, whether it is patient-focused, whether it's practice-based or PRN, typically will actually be conducted in naturalistic setting. Therefore, allowing a maximum number of therapists and clients to be involved. The study, most of them, or at least many of them, actually are based on the adoptions of standardized measurement systems as part of the routine practice. That is, this is an agreement between the researchers and clinicians that the instruments that are being used, rather than being imposed by a research protocol that is being conducted from a university or in order to meet the criteria of grant agency, these are instruments that the clinicians and the researcher are agreeing that this will actually be used as part of the clinical practice, not something that is being imposed but actually that will be serving both scientific and clinical purposes. And there are many of these instruments that have been developed, such as the OQ, for example, the CORE, uh, the TOP. Many of these instruments have been actually used in clinical practice as a way of conducting research. And then there is a number of goals that are shared by these three major cluster of practice-oriented research. Uh, the first one is to provide practitioner to, with the opportunity of being an active participant. So moving away from research that many of us, certainly I have conducted, which is to kind of approaching clinicians and say, hey, you know, I have developed this questionnaire or this questionnaire I've been developed uh, and I'm not really interested of knowing what you think about this questionnaire. I just want you to actually use it in, in, in your practice or in this study. Um, and this is drastically different from practice-oriented research where the voice of the clinician is important 
to be able to, uh, in the selections or in the constructions of the instrument, because uh, one of the goals is to really being able to address some concerns that the clinicians have and the researcher have, and also to make the informations being valid which is directly related to the second goal, which is that to use the data as it's being collected to inform the interventions during the therapy. Uh, I refer to this second point in, in papers as, as conducting uh, clinically syntonic research, that is research that is being done while or data that is being collected while the therapy or the assessment is also being conducted. So that we have here a way of confounding research and practice where the clinician gets into a position where optimally she or he does not know whether they are conducting research or they're collecting information for their clinical practice. And then the key there is that rather than having to wait for a very long time, a year or two years or three years after the study is conducted to see what, what are the findings, is to be able to benefit uh, in terms of information that is being acquired by or generated by the instruments that are being used as the therapy is actually progressing. So a very good example of that is outcome monitoring where people actually are collecting data uh, in terms of the process of change as the data is collected. And similarly, we have conducted studies where the clinician is receiving feedback from the, from, the, from the clients in terms of what they find helpful or non-helpful as the, the therapy is conducted and that receiving this data is not only serving the goal of the research, but it's also informing the clinicians in terms of how she or he can actually be more attuned to the needs of the clients. Another characteristic that is shared by these three major cluster of uh, practice-oriented research, again, patient focus, practice base, practice, -orient uh, practice research network, is to examine questions that are being perceived as being very relevant, really important for the clinician. So in, in some ways this is directly addressing the potential of empirical imperialism where, again, academicians who see few clients are dictating what we should study and how we should be studying it. And also related to that is to allowing practitioners to contribute to the accumulations of rigorous knowledge. This is directly a contrast between the way that Frequently, the connections between science and practice is being viewed, which is that knowledge is generated, supposedly empirical knowledge by academicians, and then is exported to the clinicians. Uh, and that the role of the clinician essentially is to be a passive receiver or passive somebody who is basically importing knowledge that is coming from an environment frequently that is different from the environment where they work in their day-to-day. -day. And it's not, again, to say that evidence-based practice or the traditional form of doing research has not provided tremendous helpful contribution to the field. It has and will continue to do, but that's not the only way. There's a complementary between traditional research being done by most of the academicians and their colleagues and a research where Part of the agenda and part of the knowledge is accumulated by people who are as smart, as engaged, but as looking at the phenomenon from a different angle. Um, now, I want to talk a little bit about why uh, we should do practice-oriented research. Again, that's not the only type of research that we should do, but why we should do this. There's a number of reasons. One is because it will compensate some of the limitations of evidence-based research. Uh, you know, actually, they're very complementary, as I said many times. Uh, certainly, there's an emphasis in the traditional research in terms of internal validity. Um, and there's also an emphasis on external validity uh, from the side of the practice-oriented research. So these two type of research can actually uh, compensate for the limitations of each 
uh, each other. There's also a possibility of increasing our confidence in knowledge when you have phenomenon that are actually or phenomena that are actually confirmed uh, by different source of knowledge. Um, let's say by research that is being done in really controlled environments and research that is being done in more practice-oriented environments, such for example the importance of the therapeutic relationship. When the phenomena is when the phenomenon is actually being uh, there's the, the supporting evidence for a phenomenon that comes from drastically different ways of conducting research then we can actually have more confidence that this is something that is real. What I'm saying, by the way, by drastic differences, it's also very important not to uh, create some false dichotomy. It is to assume that there are some type of research that uh, cannot be done in a practice oriented research. You frequently will hear people is if we are doing research in clinical practice, it can only be research that is um, descriptive or qualitative. That most of this research should pay attention to relationship variables. And in fact, uh, many of the research that have been conducted are addressing a lot more issues than the therapeutic relationship. They're also addressing issues about interventions and and empirically supported treatment research uh, that has been conducted in practice-oriented research also include randomized clinical trials, so it's not restricted to descriptive or qualitative type of research. Um, so there's, we, 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 it's important to recognize that there are some difference between the more traditional and the practice-oriented research, but we should not necessarily assume that if clinicians are doing research uh, in their own practice that they are some type of design that they will not be able to use. Actually, we have here uh, in our own practice research network did some research that involved a focus on technique and randomizations, and we're certainly not the only one who act actually have randomized clients within our own clinical practice. The other reason why we should do this is because this is a way to broaden our understanding uh, and practice of psychotherapy. Um, one of the problems I think that we have is uh, the clinician is not receiving as much attention in terms or recognitions in terms of ideas to actually guide our understanding from a scientific perspective as well as from a conceptual perspective. Uh, this has been pointed out by Alan Kazin. He talked about that actually the fact that one of the problem is that we, to use his words now, we have let the knowledge of clinicians uh, to dip, uh, drift through the holes of a colanders. Uh, essentially, basically, we are losing many of the ideas of clinicians by having our research being conducted and being generated uh, mostly by, again, by uh, researchers who do not see a lot of uh, clients. It's important for me to repeat that many times. And it's also provide a voice to the clinicians, not only in terms of how we should study the phenomenon, but what are the phenomenon that are really, really important, that should be a concern not only for them and for their clients, but to the field uh, in general. Another really important aspect of why we should actually conduct practice-oriented research is because if we actually do so, many, not all, but many of the research will be actually research that will be relevant to different theoretical orientations. It will actually be influenced by and contributing to the movement of integrations. Many, many therapists in the real world uh, define themselves as being integrative. There are not a large number of clients, certainly not the majority of the clinicians, who actually define themselves as belonging to one specific form of orientation. And many of the research that is being done in a traditional setting is tied to one orientation. And this is, this is yet an example of this divorce there between 
the academics, uh, academia, and the clinical practice. And there is, I think, a possibility that practice-oriented research will actually offer a kind of a nesting between research and practice by actually a lot of the research looking at phenomena that cut across different orientations and actually address different aspects of the integration movement in the field. Now, um, there are a number of uh, I, I want to kind of like uh, talk a little bit about some caveats here. There's a lot of uh, research that has been conducted from a partnership perspective. Uh, I do have to say from the get-go that, of course, many of the examples that I'm going to actually say are the, are the one that I'm more knowledgeable about, so I need to recognize that uh, my research is coming from three uh, practice research uh, network, one that is being done here at Penn State where we have transformed our clinic, training clinic into a practice research network. Also in a practice research network from uh, with a full-time clinician as well as a practice research network that with my colleagues Ben Luck and Jeff Ayes we have developed with counseling centers at universities. I've also been involved for the last 10 years with colleagues particularly David Cross, who has developed one of the standardized assessments, so also involved in measurement of the effectiveness of psychotherapy, looking at one of the instruments that I mentioned earlier at the top. So some of my suggestions that I'm going to mention today in terms like what we should do and what we should avoid doing or what we should keep in mind when we are actually uh, doing research will be coming from these personal experience as well as a series of articles that uh, my friend and colleague Chris Morant and I have been uh, uh, guest editing. It's a series that will actually take place, that will actually be published in 2015 in uh, Psychotherapy Research. What uh, Chris and I have done is uh, we thought it would be a great idea to complement the uh, chapters that uh, Michael, Wolfgang, Andrew, and I had just written for the Handbook of Psychotherapy. Um, that chapter, as I mentioned, kind of summarized uh, the state, the current states of the field. And even though uh, we were convinced that there has been quite a bit of finding that have been generated, it's nothing, of course, to compare to how much uh, empirical findings are coming from the more traditional research. So it was very important for Chris and I to actually try to see if we could find a way uh, with psychotherapy research to foster more of practice-oriented research. So what we actually did is we invited uh, 11 groups of people who over the years have been involved in conducting and publishing, and by no means this is the only one, but we selected 11 groups of people who have been conducting and publishing practice-oriented research. And what we did is we invited them to talk about their experience. We invited them to tell us a bit about the context of why they're conducting uh, their research, uh, what, what led them to conduct their research. We asked them to tell us about briefly about some of the studies that they actually conducted. And then we, told, we asked them, what are the obstacles and the challenges that you actually have faced when you are conducting the study? What are some of the solutions, the strategy that you developed that worked or did not work when you tried to address those challenges? What are the general recommendations that you actually came up with that you can make now to the field? Taking together, these 11 main papers of this series is looking at a variety, a wide range of clinical setting, private practice, training clinic, um, looking at community centers, uh, centers that provide both uh, therapy as well as training, uh, very large infrastructure, nationals infrastructure in, in, in Sweden, in, in UK, in Germany, uh, as well as organizations such as the American Psychiatric Associations. So 
many clinical settings uh, over several countries in three continents, and different types of methodology, qualitative, descriptive, correlational experimental studies. Some of these research uh, have been come from have been conducted uh, from a from mostly from researcher perspective who have established collaborations uh, with the clinicians. Some have come mostly from to start with from the clinicians who then established a collaboration from a researchers, but a large number of them was a kind of an active uh, full collaborations between, from the get-go, between the researchers uh, and the clinicians. The number of studies that came out of this actually cut across many, many important dimensions in psychotherapy research, the assessments of change via outcome uh, monitoring, the effectiveness of different therapeutic approaches, interventions, specific technique, a training program, variables related to the clients, to the therapy, therapist, the treatment characteristics, and of course process uh, and outcome variables such as the technique or the therapist. So I'm going to rely a lot on uh, basically I'm just putting down what I should have actually uh, put down earlier as I was talking about is I'm going to mostly be focusing on the issue of the lesson learned in terms of the obstacles and solution for the rest uh, of this presentations. I'm not going to talk much about the benefits, uh, but there's a major sections in each of the 11 uh, papers that were presented. Uh, and what we also did is uh, Chris and I, but also with the help of, of friends and colleagues, uh, Sue uh, that I mentioned, Young, uh, Henry Chow, and Jacques Barber, we actually looked at these 11 papers and we actually derive some consensus in terms of what are the studies that are being conducted across these different naturalistic settings, what are the type of problems that people have encountered, what are the strategies that they develop, what are the general recommendations. And this is the last paper in the series that will be published uh, in 2015. And today I'm going to be talking about some of these issues that we highlight during in that paper, mostly focusing based on the talk of the webinar today, uh, mostly focusing on the obst obstacle uh, and some of the strategies. So what to do or to avoid doing and what are the things that uh, we can do in order to prevent or to repair some of those problems. Okay, so let's get to this. Uh, what are some of the obstacles? Again, what I'm presenting here, and of course I will, when I provide example, talk more about things that are directly related to some of the studies that my students and my colleague have conducted because I know them more. But I'm going to try now to emphasize or to talk about some of the obstacles that can be derived that Sue, Chris, Henry, Jacques, and I actually derive from looking at this series of 11 papers again, that cross different continents, different naturalistic settings. And the first one is that they are clinical concerns. Uh, what is very, very clear, what emerged from all of these partnerships is that when clinicians uh, have been asked to or volunteer or decide, let's conduct some study here, they have been concerns that have been expressed across all of these partnerships. Is this, is this research worthwhile? Is it, is it dangerous? Is it uh, feasible? And clearly, we, show, we need to understand as researchers uh, and to validate and to, to actually address the best that we can those clinical concerns by having dialogue, of course, but also by conducting research that are worthwhile, that are informative, that are feasible, and that can increase the possibility of improving our understanding of psychotherapy and, and potentially improving our impact. So some of the concerns that people have actually raised is that, um, you know, it may well be that when uh, information is collected, 
let's say, outcome information is collected by the clients, that this may actually generate negative reactions to the clients in terms of the time that they have to provide in order to uh, give us the data. Uh, some clinicians have voiced the fact that it can create some difficulty in the therapeutic relationship or interfere with the process of, 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 of the therapy in terms of time, for example, or that research can actually simply fail to provide with clinically uh, helpful information. This, these are concerns that have been voiced. Another concern that I've been voiced that needs to be understood, that needs to be validated, is that maybe the data that will be collected uh, for outcome monitoring, for instance, may actually reveal negative findings or result that could have a negative impact on the practice of the clinicians or a treatment center in terms of performance evaluations, referral, or in terms of income. In other words, Many clinicians across those settings, across those partnerships, have basically said, look, I'm not sure I can trust this. You know, there is the kind of like the fear of Big Brother, and it should actually be addressed, and it should be validated, that when the data is out of the hands of the clinicians, there is always a risk that there could be a negative consequences. Practitioners have also, and that's absolutely correct to do so, to they have questioned the ability of specific outcome results to accurately capture what is taking place with their clients, as well as to appropriately, is it possible to appropriately understand the difficulty of the client just by looking at the outcome measure without taking, uh, taking considerations of the context of the client's actual situations. And those concerns, by the way, have been voiced with regard to outcome monitoring, but they have been voiced by other procedures that have been used in those, in other form of studies that have been conducted in those partnerships. So, for example, when clinicians are being asked to have their video of therapy to be uh, monitored, to be evaluated, or when they are being used, they're being asked to implement a empirically supported treatment to see if actually it has an impact in their practice. Many people have felt very uncomfortable that this is dictating uh, their own practice or may lead to a negative evaluations. And by the way, this concerns is also experience, uh, not only by experienced clinicians, people who have a lot of experience, but also by less experience. Uh, remember vividly when we uh, uh, set a system of outcome monitoring in our clinical uh, training and then we actually offer uh, students to conduct some research uh, in our training clinic, uh, therefore with the clients, that many of the students, therefore clinicians, were feeling a syndrome of imposter there. They were feeling like, look, these clients are basically uh, at a disadvantage because they are working with clinicians who do not have a lot of experience. We don't know if we're doing a very, very good job. So I feel very, very, very comfortable to actually then asking them to do more, especially if it's for me or for my colleague, like collecting data. It's very important to understand that many clinicians will actually feel uncomfortable about asking their clients to uh, to collect data for them. Another, by the Louis, way, another yes. Yeah, can I jump in really quickly? Absolutely. We have a question from uh, from Martin, and Martin, what I'm going to do is try to open up your mic so that you can ask the question in your own words. Let's see if that works. So, Martin, go ahead. Um, hi, thanks for fielding the question. Um, it, it's really uh, speaking to what you're discussing regarding. Um, uh, the barriers to getting research accomplished, and one of the barriers can very much be uh, legal teams uh, who are extremely conservative and get quite nervous about uh, any outcome measures that include questions about uh, suicide. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering how uh, what, what you've come across with that and uh, how, to, how you've gone about removing that as an obstacle. Thank you. Well, that's a very, very, very crucial question, of course. Um, and you know, I think in some ways this is one of the uh, source of common difficulty that both 
practice-oriented research and the more traditional-oriented research has actually been encountered there, which is the issue of when we are working with uh, the Office of Research Project, uh, Protections there. And uh, I think there's not um, specific, what I would actually say with regard to that, right, is that uh, this is where actually the collaborations with clinicians may actually make things a little bit easier in a way that typically when when a researcher is working with or collaborating with the Office of Research Protections, uh, this is kind of a North American term, but essentially the kind of the legal within a university, it's basically a, a, a dialogue that is taking place between uh, staff uh, who don't see any clients and faculty member. And to actually enter in a dialogue uh, the clinicians can actually provide a more realistic perspective about the danger there. So I, I'd say this cannot be ignored and the fact that when the research is being conducted it's still in many many cases, at least certainly when it's taking place in North America, the, the, it has to be approved by the Office of Research Projection actually to have clinicians to be able to hear the voice of the clinicians to talk about what's realistic in terms of danger and what actually is part of the clinical reality, such as the issue of suicide, for example, or suicide risk, is something that the clinicians is actually dealing on the day-to-day -day basis. So that this is a place where actually we have a perspective, an opinion that actually say if we have a research program that is conducted in the clinical routine as a way of understanding and improving the clinical routine, there's some phenomenon that cannot be ignored and should actually be part of the research, um, uh, the research protocol. So one of the ways that we have dealt with this in our own clinic is to actually create uh, specific agreement with the Office of Research Projections uh, to really kind of have them understand that this is not a project that comes from the agenda of researchers that may have unintended consequences, but it's more it's a research that is taking place with a clinical the reality in the clinical reality and therefore phenomenon of the clinical reality will not be disregarded, they will actually be part of the research protocol, such as the issue of the suicide. So I would say to answer your question there, we have the same problem, uh, but in some ways I think that we are more an advantage because the type of research that is being done is not imposing a drastic change in the clinical reality is starting with the clinical reality, including this issue of, of, um, of suicide or, or major depression, for example. Does that answer your question? Uh, hang on, let me uh, open Martin's window back up again really quickly so that he can respond. Go ahead, Martin. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, that's uh, helpful. I'm, I'm actually, uh, I think it's a bit deceiving because I have an English accent, but I'm working in America. Um, so I know it's just tricky getting the uh, legal team to understand um, IRB and, and that the IRB is uh, actually well legally thought out as well. Uh, Absolutely. Legal, teams, legal teams tend to be highly conservative, and, and so I think that's an ongoing uh, discussion. But thank you, that was a very helpful answer. Yeah, yeah. Actually, you know, in, in one of the paper in the series, we actually describe some of the work that my colleague here, Aaron Pincus, and myself have actually worked. We actually have worked with the RIB and brought in their lawyers to, to have them really understand that the research that we were doing was clinically centonic. It was something that we were not imposing to the clinical reality. And therefore, we were not increasing the risk of the people but actually because it was directly linked with what was happening, uh, it, it would actually not make uh, things worse. Hopefully it would actually make things better. So where, where really there is no or there is a decrease of inconsistencies between research and clinical practice, which is in some ways is what the RB 
the Office of Protections of Resource should be the most concerned about? Is there something that the research is actually bringing in that is different from the clinical practice and that may actually have negative consequences? Those are very appropriate goals. But when your research is actually saying within the practice, we actually want to study as the practice is taking place. Therefore, suicide, for example, does not come as something that will be increased in terms of risk, but as something that is there whether or not there is a resource. So we might as well to try to bring a set of eyes uh, or different sets of eyes to actually look at this phenomenon. Um, so then the second obstacle that people are facing is, uh, well, is it possible to indeed collaborate and to communicate between researchers uh, and clinicians? And, uh, and, and this, you know, touched directly what I actually talked earlier about empirical imperialism that can manifest itself uh, subtly. Uh, so, for example, I've actually certainly created these problems when some of my uh, colleagues, the researcher and I, were uh, discussing ideas about a project that involved uh, clinicians, and we were doing it because of proximity. We were in the same office, and we caught ourselves by saying, oh, my God, look at what we're doing here. We're just a bunch of researchers, and we're thinking about the design without having a constant communications uh, with the clinicians. And of course, in the most extreme cases would be when administrator of the centers and researchers are deciding what to do and how to do it and are, you know, imposing it to the clinicians. So we always have to be, you know, very concerned about these issues of uh, imposing a source of knowledge or a way of doing things. It's also very important to keep in mind that clinicians and researchers are talking different type of language and that the same words may have really different significations or meaning or emotional impact. Uh, if you talk about evidence, it tends to be have a very kind of uh, positive uh, sound to many researchers, but evidence could actually have a more mixed uh, perspective on the parts uh, of the clinicians. So it's also very important to keep in mind that uh, our clinicians and researchers live in different culture. They face different demands, different expectations. They pursue different goals, uh, all of which can actually have different uh, uh, needs. It reflect different needs, but also conflictual needs. It's also very important to keep in mind when you're doing practice-oriented research that clinicians and researchers operate on different timetable that uh, it's, it, it's nothing that uh, is surprising for a researcher to be thinking that result can take five, ten years before actually being presented, which does not necessarily sit very well to clinicians who actually need to know right now how we should actually work with the clients. It's also very important to keep in mind that there's a ton of pragmatic issues that may interfere uh, with practice-oriented research. Perhaps the most important one is time. You know, we're all very, very, very busy, and therefore research will actually compete uh, with the daily demands. And some of the research that we conducted here in the Pennsylvania Psychological Association, PRN, and some of the studies that we have conducted, again, this was generated by both the researchers and the clinicians. The, Design was so intense in terms of times that some clinician had to choose between collecting data or going to the bathroom. You can actually guess uh, what they actually did. They did not collect data during that time. Right? So, I mean, it's really important to keep in mind that there are some pragmatic issues that will interfere. The most important one is an issue of time. So it's important to actually create a design a study that will attempt as much as possible not to add uh, more uh, to the time of people. There's also cost when research will interfere with other needs of the clinicians and or of the clients. Uh, for example, the clinicians will actually very frequently feel like it takes quite a bit of energy to try to remember every aspect that is required by a research protocol that sometimes 
having a research protocol in their own clinical routine may infringe upon some of the responsibility of a clinician to take time away from establishing a therapeutic relationship or to have a full assessment, for example. Um, all research activities can also have an impact on the clinician's ability to generate out, uh, income because it takes time. So it is important to keep this in mind. It's also important that uh, practice-oriented uh, research may be inconsistent with the needs of the academicians. Not all universities will actually, or funding agency will actually give a lot of priorities to clinically oriented research. Uh, there's an incompatibility between uh, the time that it takes to do research in clinical routine and routine and the time that the person, that a person, especially uh, when the person is early in or his career, whether a graduate students or going up for 10 years. So it's very, very important to keep this in mind that there might be a time and a place before researcher at different phase of their career will actually engage in practice-oriented research. And definitely one of the advice that we have come very, very clearly about this, you can't do that. You should not be doing this alone, especially if you want to complete your PhD and using this type of research or if you want to go for tenure. You need to do that with the help of other researchers. So these are some of the obstacles. I want to talk uh, some of the fostering strategies, some of them directly addressing the problems that I talked about earlier, the obstacle, and some of the other fostering strategy may also addressing other, uh, other problem, other challenges that we are confronted with. And again, let me remind you of this, like these strategies are not coming only from my research, the research that I've conducted with my students, they are actually coming from those 11 group of researchers that actually have conducted practice-oriented. So the first one is to really put premium on clinical relevance and beyond. Of course, if you are doing study that is not directly related to the clinical practice, um, many of the clinicians will lose interest. But we need to go, actually, if we want this to work, we need to go one step beyond. That is, what we need to do is we need to do research that are, is informative. And ideally, a research that is immediately informative. This is coming back to the concept earlier of confounding research and practice or having clinically syntonic research. That is, a research where when the person is collecting the data, she or he does not know whether they're collecting the data for research, that they are collaborating with other, uh, including researcher, or if they are actually collecting data that is also useful clinically. That's, that is probably one of the best key to conduct successful uh, practice-oriented research, when there is not an addition of time, when there is a pure confound between the activities that is research or that is practice. And of course, this will actually directly address the issue of time. If what you're doing, if, if when you are, for example, receiving feedback about the outcome, or you're receiving feedback as part of a research protocol about the process, this information can not only lead to really clinically useful and relevant research, but it can also influence you in terms of your note-taking and your preparations of the next sessions. As Hector uh, Fernandez uh, Alvarez and his, and his colleagues have actually pointed out, research data uh, could also or should also be used in supervision. That's one yet another way of confounding research and clinical utility where it's not only where data is not only used for publications five or ten years down the line but is actually being used in different serving different functions or clinical function as well as as empirical function as soon as possible uh, directly related to the clinical relevance is is the suggestion that have come from many of the practice-oriented research of having studies that do not impose a drastic change in clinical practice. 
If you actually want to be very successful in conducting practice-oriented research, you might want to be thinking about testing things, whether it's in interventions, whether it's in assessments, that will not force the clinicians to abandon either for their entire caseload or for some clients what they have been doing for the last 5, 10, or 20 years. Rather, you want to be thinking about how can we construct together and add something in the clinical practice that will, again, just increment what we are doing, such as receiving feedback, for instance, not having to impose a drastic change. You know, clinicians are not likely to be very enthusiastic if, if we're saying to them, you know what, you know, you've, when you were working with depression, this is really, really good, but now you've got to actually completely abandon the way that you were doing it, and for the next 18 months, you've got to be using only this form of treatment. This is a very good example of empirical imperialism. It's much better to be thinking about working together and saying, we're going to start with your current practice, the way you practice it, and why don't together we try to find a way to add it in a, in a way that will not add much time and that will just complement your, your clinical practice. We need to address the threats and the anxiety, all of the concerns that I mentioned earlier in terms of like, is, is this going to be dangerous for my practice? Is, is this going to be an issue of big brother here? And, and, and many, if most of the authors in the different papers of this series have pointed out that the crucial issue here is to be very transparent. It's to be very transparent for the clinician. This is how this information can be used, uh, and this is what it's not going to be used. And of course, you will actually have an increased uh, probability of having a full engagement there if there is an assurance that uh, the data is not going to be served for negative functions in terms of evaluations and therefore preventing the person from having how come, from from having income or from from actually. Uh, uh, referrals. It's also very important to kind of uh, uh, to have an agreement with the clinicians that whatever piece of data is being collected, uh, this data will never be enough, will never be sufficient. This will not replace uh, clinical judgments. Whether it's outcome or process data that is being collected, this is a way of complementing and hopefully help improving the clinical judgment, not replacing them. It's also very important to actually address uh, some of the apprehensions of the, 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 that, that clinicians can have uh, in terms of whether the research task can be of value. Uh, and this is where data can actually be very, very helpful. I vividly remember when we were uh, uh, creating here at Penn State uh, or transforming our clinic in terms of a, of a, of a PRN. Uh, many of the clinicians were really uh, afraid, the students were really concerned, as I mentioned earlier, about uh, is that going to be helpful? Am I, in other words, basically uh, taking something out of my clients without having been able to offer anything? Am I taking advantage of the clients, the people who actually uh, I'm supposed to help? And it was tremendously helpful to be able to show to our graduate students we actually had an instrument at the top that compared what they were doing with really experienced clinicians in the PRN uh, that we had developed uh, in town who were experienced clinicians. And we were able to show to our students that actually they were better than experienced clinicians when dealing with very severe psychopathology and suicide that the experienced therapists would do it. Uh, another strategy to actually address the threats and anxiety is to also have clinical colleagues to talk to other uh, clinicians. Because there's so far we can go as researchers or as graduate students to reassure clinicians that this is going to be helpful, not dangerous. Um, it's a lot more to actually gather feedback from the clinicians who actually have collected the data. And in one paper, by the way, that Sue uh, Young, actually a uh, first author, she has made the point that one of the ways to increasing 
the participations in practice-oriented research is to foster a corrective experience. That is, to have clinicians realizing and then uh, disseminating, uh, talking about how in some ways they were really afraid that the data they were collected would be either useless or dangerous and that to their surprise and positive surprise that this data that was reliable and valid actually was also clinically very, very helpful. And to tell to the clinicians these positive experiences that people actually had. The other really important fostering strategy that came across very, very clearly uh, is to enhancing communications collaborations. Really, from a uh, metaphor perspective, communications and collaboration is really the blood that maintains uh, the life in a professional uh, collaboration. So one of the things that people have talked about across the 11 papers is you actually have to have a, a lot of meetings, a lot of work doing practice-oriented research. Because not only do you have to meet with your graduate students and your colleagues, you actually have to work with other groups, whether it's clinicians, whether it's people from the Office of Research, whether it is the health, whether it's the insurance company, is you need to spend a lot of time. And here I want to talk a little bit about the regular meetings that you need to have with clinicians to discuss, to understand, to validate, the needs, the concerns that every con contributor can actually have. Um, one point, by the way, that was focused by uh, Anne Garland and Lauren uh, Brookman uh, Frazee in their paper is you need to establish trust and a common language between the different uh, collaborators in practice-oriented research. And the way to do that is not only to have a lot of meetings, but to also to uh, encouraging reciprocal enthusiasm and collaboration, and also they point out, interestingly, a willingness from all the parties to go above and beyond what they actually agreed on. I mean, this is one of the experiences that my colleagues have throughout the three practice research network that we have. When it works, it's actually, there's a synergy that is taking place out of the collaborations, and the graduate students, the faculty members, the clinicians, the administrator actually end up doing more during the project than what they first agreed up because it actually becomes uh, very kind of exciting for all the parties. Uh, it's very important to actually also create a sense of, of, uh, of engagement, reciprocal engagement, and a very strong alliance between the different parties there. And one of the ways to actually do that is to create a sense of local ownership, that everybody actually is owning the data. I mean, it's not only the issue that the researchers are doing the data, and that the clinicians can actually provide some, some cues or some questions. Actually, when the clinicians are interested, it becomes really important to provide uh, not only the opportunity, but the data set that they actually have collected, so that they actually own this data set and that they can actually do their own statistical analyses. Another way to enhance the communications and the collaborations, by the way, is to be aware that, of course, there's complementary goals, and there's not necessarily inconsistencies between those goals. So it's not that collecting data in terms of, uh, of being able to come up with patterns of change, which researchers might be interested, that this is in consistence with the uh, clinician really trying to understand what is informative and helpful for one specific client. And there is nothing that is inconsistent with administrators to actually being able to be more effective in the care that they are providing. But it's also important that to realize that there's this tremendous amount of convergence between, and this has been over the last 15 years, the type of research that I've been conducting, I have been pleasantly surprised uh, and reassured to realize that the goals that I have as an academician and other researchers are very, very convergent with the goals of clinicians. I've been really surprised to kind of see that frequently the type of research that I want to conduct is also the research, the questions that the clinicians actually want to address. 
And therefore, there is a lot of convergence. I talk about complementarity, but when people are looking at the same phenomenon, and if they are looking at it, and their main difference is the perspective that they're looking at it from an academic or clinical perspective, very frequently the things that will be of interest is very, very convergent. That's really, really good news. That's a good news for a specific project, but it's also really important to that we recognize that all of us are interested essentially to the same two major goals. We want to have a better understanding of psychotherapy and we want to improve care. All of us wants to do that. And therefore, one strategy to foster the collaboration and is to really constantly remind each other that we're doing that for big, huge goals. We're after big dreams to try to actually create a sense of community as Andrew McLevy talked about in one of his paper, creating a sense of community about these very overarching goals of advancing practice and advancing uh, science. Now the other thing is that some of the strategy is to actually making it possible by creating, having some resources and addressing pragmatic issues. Uh, essentially, when you think about practice-oriented research, it requires two things. It requires a ton of time and it requires a ton of people. A ton of people who typically works in different type of environment. But I'm going to focus more here in terms of time. The issue is one of the lessons that people have actually said is more you're going to be spending time preparing, anticipating problems, dealing with possible problems before the study is actually taking place, more you're going to be successful. And one of the strategies that we have used, for example, is to come up with scripts with different levels of details in terms of how to actually address the different problems that will actually take place. If there is one advice among many that I would suggest based on my experience in tree practice research network and working with effectiveness psychotherapy with the top is more you spend time to actually automatize or to actually have clear guidelines of what to do and when to do and try to anticipate as many problems as possible more pleasant and more successful it will actually be. So we have spent a lot of time to create scripts, as I mentioned earlier, to anticipate the problems and also having a tremendous uh, openness to, uh, what's very helpful is to have a system in place where when the person are starting to do study, clinicians in their own practice, that there is always people who rapidly can actually provide information, feedback, helpful comments. So what you want to do when you actually are starting a study, you want to actually have a lot of meetings before you're doing it, and you want to do a lot of meetings at the beginning of the study. And you have to want to have a constant channel of communication. You can't just to come up and just say, well, here's a treatment protocol. We talked about it for a number of months. Let's go and apply it. Because the first day that the program is going to be actually installed, going to be implemented, people will call and say, I got a problem here. I did not, we did not anticipating this. So that's been a very, very important uh, informations or cues. And the other one that is very important is keep it as simple as possible. That is, make sure that the research is not adding too much to the complexity of the clinical practice. Everybody is practicing, whether we see two clients a week or 20 knows that it's complicated. There's a lot of things we got to do. So if you add to this complexity, you will make it very, very, very difficult. So a good example of this, we have conducted this study again. This was something that was created by clinicians and researchers. And in our first protocol, we decided, OK, all of our clients that will come in our practice, all of them, we will randomly assign them to different conditions if we judge that it is appropriate to invite them to participate and if they do agree. And therefore, for a period of 12 months, all our clients 
myself and, and my clinical, clinical colleagues, all of the clients were actually participating in the treatment protocol. That was way, way, way too much. And one of the lessons that we have learned is we need to decrease that. So the next study that we conducted, we never had more than four clients who were participating in the study. Therefore, we would be randomly assigning clients, the first four clients that came in, if they accept and if we judge that it was, a, it was okay to, to invite them to participate in the study. And then after four, this is where we would actually stop recruiting uh, new clients. Of course, to make it possible, there's a lot of resources uh, that needs to be, uh, to, that we need to have. Uh, one of the important resources, of course, that would always be helpful is to have some financial incentive. It's the best way to actually collecting data um, by offering to our clients uh, money if, if the data is being returned. That's the same thing as we have in traditional type of, of, of research. Uh, but funding, of course, is a difficult issue. Funding is a difficult issue in the sense of there are some people who have been able, indeed, to get big, huge grants, um, but it's not always possible. Funding agencies are not necessarily uh, really keen on doing this type of research. Uh, and one way is to actually be thinking outside the box there. Many people have been successful in funding some private fundings or agency. Uh, but I must say, you know, it's also very important to keep in mind that getting funding to do this type of study is a double-edged sword. That is, there's a potential curse of actually relying on huge, huge funding. And the curse is that maybe there are some researchers who will conduct practice-oriented research as long as they can get a big grant. And they will stop when they can't do that. And also the issue is if we are doing a study that in order to be conducted, it absolutely requires some money. Well, we can be pretty sure that the study is not going to be retainable. That is, we need to have studies that are actionable, that we can actually conduct it. But ultimately, what we need is we actually need to have studies that people will want to retain. So if we can actually find a ways to conduct study with a minimal amount of money, it will make our administrators, the deans, the chair less happy, of course, if you're academicians. At the same time, though, it make it more uh, reasonable to actually conduct it. Hi, Louis. I have a couple of questions, but yeah. I want to save them for after. Maybe you could just summarize organizational challenges, and then I'll and then I'll ask some questions. Absolutely. I want to okay. summarize that very very rapidly by saying uh, this is a place where actually uh, we can benefit here by doing practice oriented research by. Uh, using some of the strategy that the more typical traditional evidence-based research have been used, have been, have been conducting. So for example, uh, clinicians when they will be, uh, they will be invited to join, whether it's a, a, a clinician from a single office or clinicians in the center, will be confronted with the issue of the Office of Research Protection, so the, the RRB, and therefore one way that we can handle this challenge or that we have handled this challenge is to actually creating a team uh, in different PRN settings who will actually write the RRB forms for the clinicians. So to kind of address these type of issues. Uh, and also to kind of keep in mind that if you want to conduct research that involve more centers, you need not only centralizations in terms of how the data is being collected, but you need to identify in every site a local champion. Somebody will be working, typically clinicians, in one site and will have a direct collaborations between the group of researchers. And also to make sure that the information that is provided early on in a study 
is actually passed on from one core to another. This is particularly important if you actually want to have your study being part of the clinical routine, not only for a short or specific project, but part of your routine in general. People will tend to forget, especially if you have new group of clinicians, whether it's in training, training settings, or in private practice where there's a lot of change. So I'll stop here, Sam, uh, for opening questions. Okay. Uh, so we have, we, have a, we have three really great questions so far. Um, and I'm going to open up mics. Um, hopefully the, the questioners will be able to ask them in their own words. Uh, Ignacio, I'm going to start with you. I'm going to open up your mic. Hello, Louis. How are you? Very good, Ignacio. How are you? Very well, thanks. My, my question is, is at the time being, oh, give me one second, I'm having rebound sound. And my, my question is, I'm participating in a study as a treating therapist, as a cognitive behavioral therapist, and we have a partial disagreement with the researchers conducting the study. Um, we are actually doing a process outcome study and of a single case, and uh, Basically, we are trying not to overload the patient with questionnaires, so we are being really picky in what to use. And basically, the, the area of, the, of the debate is to use a general, a general outcome uh, instrument such as the OQ45 or the SCL90, which is what the researchers would, would rather do. But I myself, as operating as a therapist, I would rather use um, instruments specifically tied to the diagnosis and the targets of the treatments, such as this patient is a patient with comorbid GAD and panic disorder, so I'm more inclined to using the ASI-3 and well, a GAD specific instruments. So how do you feel about situations similar to this one? So it's a great question, and this is a place where really um, you have in some ways a kind of a potential inconsistency, right, between the researchers and the clinician. Interestingly, though, it's an inconsistency uh, that is different from you typically encounter in the old traditional research when you have the researcher who is dictating this is what we're going to be using and the clinicians may be hesitant that this is imposing because what I'm hearing in SEO from what you're saying is you're not necessarily against using a general instruments. You also want to have an instrument that it will actually capture something that is specific, more unique to your clients. In other words, if I hear you correctly, is that you actually would like to do more than what the researcher is offering, which is a very interesting contrast with what frequently we have, or actually I had in my past experience. And then this is the place where I think essentially is that a cost-benefit analysis needs to be done. There's a cost-benefit with the clinicians and the researcher to talk together in terms of what are we getting and what is the cost of it. And if I was working with you as a researcher in YESO and you would come to me and you would say, you know, uh, I actually want to be using these extra instruments, I would say, well, this is actually going to cost you more time. You do realize that. You're going to actually assign it. You're going to have to interpret it. And so then the issue becomes is, what are we going to do with this? Are you, are you really willing to do more? Does that mean like we have to really reduce the number of clients that you're actually going to see in order to be able to be to do something that you feel that clinically would be more valid and more appropriate? but that may impose too much of a burden to you and to your clients? Uh, or do we actually want to uh, basically have one source of data that as part of the research program everybody is using, but at the same time not restricting the clinicians to use other stuff? And then the key there is to monitor it and to say, did you do something else? 
right? And as long as what you actually have as an agree upon is something that is part of your clinical routine, it should not be a problem, right? Because essentially what you're measuring is adding something like the OQ, for example, or the SCL90, part of the practice, does that make your understanding of psychotherapy or your practice of psychotherapy more effective? In addition to whatever else as a clinician you would actually be using. So the last thing I would say as a researcher, right, is I would be very, very, very concerned about to say to your clinicians, you know what, you want to participate in this study, we want to form a team, but please use this, but do not use anything else. This would actually be a major faux pas there. And the key is to kind of say, all right, finding a way of addressing the issue of internal validity, standardization, so perhaps collecting information so that we actually know when there was more that was done to the protocol. But I would be very uncomfortable to actually say to the clinicians, this you can't do. Does that answer Great. your question? Great. Thank you, Louis. So the next, so we're gonna, I'm just going to keep us moving uh, so that we can get through the remaining questions. Um, and, uh, and if you have further questions, you and we'll make sure that that email gets forwarded to Louis so that he can address that question. So the next question we have comes from William Andrews. And William, I'm going to try and open up your mic. Go ahead. Oh, hello, Louis. Can you hear me? Yeah, Hi. I can hear you. Uh, this is Bill Andrews from the Pragmatic Research Network in the UK. Uh -huh. um, Louis, I have sort of two points, really. The first point is that I love your expression for empirical imperialism. And uh, certainly in the UK, it is still, uh, in our experience, very much the case that the empirical imp imperialism of the RCT at the top of the hierarchical tree of evidence remains a complete obstacle in terms of practice-based evidence. Uh, we've been gathering practice-based evidence for over seven years. We've produced evidence from hundreds of clinicians with thousands of clients, mm -hmm. robustly gathered every session measurement, but it makes no difference in terms of acceptability of evidence. Um, so I'd just be interested in your comment about that. And I'll just quickly make the second point, which is when you talk about the um, pragmatic gathering of data and obstacles that get in the way to practice. I, what we spend a lot of time doing is developing um, technology to assist the practitioners very much in easily being able to gather data of high quality. So for example, we've developed a system that allows um, a, pr a practitioner to communicate via email link with the client before sessions to fill in the measures electronically because a huge barrier is if the actual process of gathering the data and entering the data takes up a vast amount of time. So I just wanted to make those two points. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, let me start by the second one. Uh, absolutely. I mean, this is one of the recommendations if I had a little bit more time there in terms of looking at organizational challenges, that technology should actually be our friends there, that there are ways now that we can actually, again, the issue is to in a way, interestingly, right, that uh, research here, when technology is being used to collect data, empirical data, can actually help the clinical process by providing to the clinicians more feasible, more rapid feedback. So I think this is one example where there could actually be a synergy between when the goal is to collect data for empirical research, it can also move a system to actually gather clinically uh, important information and to provide it to the clinician faster. But you're absolutely right, and in the article we actually emphasize quite a bit that it's the responsibility of the administrators and the researchers to actually provide technological advances. That's a great way to fostering the strategy. Now, we've got to your first point. You know, I, I can't agree more than what you're saying. I think there is a um, there is this issue that uh, 
uh, the uh, uh, hierarchy of, of evidence uh, that uh, at the top of it is the randomized clinical trial. And, um, and, and, and this is very myopic because this is actually uh, not considering many of the flaws of randomized clinical trials. For example, Tom Borkovic has made a very, very strong argument that the, there is a major problem when you actually are using randomized clinical trial and you're comparing one form of therapy with another form of therapy, let's say cognitive theory therapy with, with psychodynamic form of therapy, because you essentially are comparing apple and oranges. What we know for science, right, from the empirical perspective, is you advance science from a randomized clinical trial if you control everything but one thing. So the issue there is if you're comparing psychodynamic therapy with cognitive behavioral therapy, you have no idea how many things are different across these orientations, right? So the, the actual, the only most scientifically solid uh, randomized clinical trial are additive designs, right? Interestingly, though, most of the scientific community is not recognizing that when they're presenting uh, the uh, hierarchical. They're kind of saying, well, if it's a randomized clinical trial, it has a cause and effect relationship. It does not. Right? This is the part where I think academicians need to do something about this. We actually need to voice it and not stop voicing it, that uh, the best way of really accumulating knowledge is to have a number of strategies complementary strategy, convergent strategy, and to understand that if we're going to be confident into one phenomenon, is if this phenomenon emerge from different epistemology or from different research methodology. That if we only rely on one methodology, such as randomized clinical trial with a ton of inclusion variables and a ton of exclusion variables, we're going to have a, a real effect there. We're going to find something but it's going to be reassuring and we can only be confident if it can also be fine with other methodology, whether it's correlational, whether it's descriptive, and it's a combination of these different methodology that are being used in different settings that will increase confidence. I cannot understand why people feel confident at this point of the game to kind of say, we do have one methodology for which we can say safely, this is the way to go. I can't understand that people are so confident about this when actually there's a ton of flaws there. And so we actually have to be very, very clear about this and voice it as much as possible that, yes, the UK system did something really good by saying that in terms of providing more service to more people, we should rely on science. Unfortunately, that the message was as long as it is CBT and as long as it is randomized clinical trial, everything's going to be accepted. And I have a major, major problem, despite the fact that I'm a CBT and despite the fact that I do conduct randomized trials. I am just not that confident that this is the only way of dealing with the complexity of reality we are confronted with. Great, Louis. Thank you. I think we have time for just one quick clarifying question, uh, which was a, a request for the reference for the criti uh, for Tom Borkovic's critique of RCTs. Yes, there is. It's uh, Borkovic and Castonguay there. I'm the second author. This was published in GCCP 1998. Uh, it was in a special series uh, that was uh, that was done. And so we, uh, we presented that paper, and Tom uh, previously has had, uh, published that in papers that are less accessible, more difficult to find. Uh, but if you look at the uh, Journal of Consulting and Clinical Psychology in 1998, uh, um, in I think the September issue, uh, uh, you'll find that, that paper, the argument that uh, Tom developed and put me as second author of the paper. Great. So I think, I think we should probably call it there because we're about 10 minutes over. Um, and I want to thank everybody for staying with us. Great questions. Uh, for those of you who have additional questions, please send them to us. We will make sure they get to Louis and that he gets a chance to see them. Um, also, if you have feedback, we'd love to see that as well. Um, 
And I'd also like to encourage uh, our listeners to send emails uh, also letting us know who they'd like to hear from in the future for future webinars. So with that, uh, I think I'd like to say thank you everybody for attending. Thank you so much, Louis, for presenting. Uh, I think this was a, a very, very timely and excellent, excellent presentation. Um, just, just based on the questions, it seems like this is something very much on the minds of, of many different people. And uh, we will uh, stay tuned for our next, uh, next webinars upcoming in um, December. All right, thank, thank you, you all. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, Sue. Very exciting.